What a, what a build-up, Tim. Thank you very much for putting that all together. Uh, I'm Harry Sherrard, and uh, together with the rest of the team, we uh, run the, the talks program here. Um, in case I forget later, I think a number of you here are not Brooklyn's members. Our friends from the uh, outreach team are at the back, uh, and they can give you lots of information about joining the uh, Brooklyn's members, and we've got lots of talks and other activities coming up the rest of this year and into uh, next year as well. Um, I've been to talk, Matt's talk once before when he gave it at Goodwood. I was absolutely mesmerised. It's an incredible achievement to have flown a single-engine Second World War era aircraft right around the world. And that aircraft, of course, the, uh, probably the most iconic aircraft ever at the Spitfire. So without any further ado, please give a warm welcome to Matt Jones. Thank you, Harry. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for turning up in, uh, in such a huge number tonight. I've, I think I've uh, delivered a speech to a maximum of 10 people before, and uh, only five of them fell asleep. So uh, it's nice and warm in here, and it's pretty dark. So if you, but I, I just, if you can keep any snoring to a minimum, that would be, uh, that would be fantastic. Um, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Matt Jones. I'm the owner and uh, managing director of Spitfires.com. We're a business uh, that's set up really to try and continue the story of the Spitfire. Everyone knows this wonderful aeroplane and uh, our company, uh, MO, was really just to carry on telling the story and doing our bit uh, to commemorate. Uh, we're based down at Goodwood. We do uh, two-seat Spitfire flights and we have a Spitfire simulator, the only uh, uh, Spitfire simulator in the world that's built out of original Spitfire parts, so it's a complete, uh, complete Spitfire cockpit. Um, I was previously an investment banker. I spent uh, four years looking out the window thinking, what have I done? Uh, watching airplanes landing uh, into Heathrow, and another four years later, I left uh, with my pilot's license and started... My flying career, uh, never then did I even dream that I could have ended up doing or being a part of a trip such as this. Flew private jets and helicopters for a while, uh, and then as a part of this business, and as a part of this uh, desire, as I mentioned earlier, to, to, to try and keep telling the story and keep commemorating this amazing part of our history, uh, the opportunity to buy an aeroplane came up, and a very, very special Spitfire at that. And with that opportunity came a huge burden, and that was how do we how do we use it to its uh, you know to its foremost to continue telling the story. And that's pretty much where the idea for the longest flight expedition uh, came about. Not 100% true, part of it was uh, in a pub somewhere and uh, stupidly I ran my mouth the next morning saying I had this great idea and once you've told 10 people you have to do it. So uh, about three years later from Goodwood we, we set off. I've mentioned a little bit about the inspiration, uh, if you want to read that bit, uh, but it really is not just about the pilots who flew these aircraft, it's about the people who designed them the people who built them, the people who maintained them, and, of course, the people who, who flew them. And the people who were uh, prepared to give up their lives in this aircraft for uh, a way of life that they believed in and that they wanted their families to grow up into. And that really was the, the sort of the, the main inspiration behind this. As part of being... Uh, a part of the uh, Spitfire Academy, we've, uh, we've put together a few other big events, and uh, most notably, uh, we flew Wing Commander Tom Neal in 2015 for the 75th anniversary uh, of the victory in the Battle of Britain. I had him in the back of my two-seat Spitfire. Prince Harry, as you can see, was there on the day. We had 34 other Spitfires and Hurricanes flying out of Goodwood that day. I gave a speech the night before uh, at the house uh, and uh, had the great honour of, of knowing Tom for, for a year or so at that point and uh, said to him, you've, you've survived the Battle of Britain, you survived the rest of the war, you survived being a test pilot in the RAF, you've got the most dangerous flight of your life coming up tomorrow morning. <laughs> He survived. In fact, uh, I, I don't know how it happened, but I did the best landing I've ever done in a Spitfire that day. 
and no one in the industry believes that he didn't take control off me uh, just, just prior to touching down. But I, I know the truth, kind of. Question we get asked a lot, why silver? Well, there are a lot of, and we have them ourselves, there are a lot of uh, aeroplanes painted in the camouflage, the correct camouflage for the type of aircraft. And they are commemorating the war, and they are commemorating the people who flew them, and they fly displays. Battlebrook Memorial Flight, Royal Air Force do a phenomenal job of that, and many, many private owners and collectors too, do too. But we wanted to differentiate slightly. We wanted to still commemorate, but make it uh, a little bit more about the beautiful design of this exceptional aeroplane. This aircraft was almost too beautiful for what it was, what it was designed to do. From a day-to-day -day point of view on the trip, it was also going to make crossing borders a lot easier because um, you know, there are people in the world who don't know what a Spitfire is, and if you turn up with guns sticking out your wings and camouflage all over your aeroplane, chances are the guys with the braid on their shoulders are going to pay a little bit more attention to you. And uh, there were some parts of the world where we certainly didn't, we didn't want that. But also, fi and finally, it was a, a nod to Tom Neal. He'd become a great friend at that point. Uh, he was 98, and he wasn't very well, and we hoped... He, so Tom Neal, uh, just to give you a bit of a backstory on that, he wrote a book called The Silver Spitfire, and essentially, during the war, he stole a Spitfire from the Royal Air Force and took all the paint off it, didn't polish it, but took all the paint off it and flew it around as his private ride for about six months before he realised, oh my God, what have I done? And then spent another six months or so trying to get rid of it. Anyway... He wrote a book called The Silver Spitfire, and we wanted to give him a reason to, to, you know, to, to wake up the next morning. Unfortunately, he saw the aeroplane, but he didn't see us go and do the trip, which was a great shame. Aeroplane we called Gertie. Uh, for those of you who are pilots in the room or know anything about aviation in this country, every British aeroplane has a five-letter designator starting with G. We wanted to give it a name. We want to inspire people. We want to inspire people of our own age, people older than us, and people younger than us. And we thought by giving it a, a name, a, a, a lady's name, that we might get a little bit more engagement. And I think that worked. History of the aeroplane. So, as I said earlier, we got this opportunity to buy this aircraft. Now, most modern-day restorations of Spitfires uh, are... are started from a very, very small piece of metal, or a few small pieces of metal. This aeroplane, having flown 51 combat missions, flown with three squadrons in the UK and ultimately in Holland, uh, last flew in 1956 and ended up in a, a Dutch museum, and essentially was protected, therefore, and mummified in its last flying state. So where other aeroplanes that have been crashed into the ground and bits have been taken out and an aeroplane's been built around them, or the very few that have carried on flying since the war, they've been repaired now so many times that actually it's a bit like Trigger's broom and how, how much of that aircraft actually flew uh, in wartime service. We pushed this entire aeroplane into the hangar looking pretty much like that. It had a slightly different scheme, but it was, for to all intents and purposes, a 100% original wartime Spitfire with incredible history. I mentioned some of its squadrons. Have a read through those. Uh, I'm not going to go through them here now, but the key numbers, as I said, 51 combat missions, one success. Uh, and in fact, the guy, the, the aeroplane that it, uh, it had a a shared success with, uh, the pilots actually both got out as well, which part of me quite likes. So it did its job, but uh, didn't cause any, any death. It had some amazing skirmishes. So the records that come with aircraft like this, or the records that are still available down at Kew, are phenomenal. And you can read every pilot's account of every time the aircraft flew and what happened. It, it, it had a head-on attack with an ME-262, the first the first Nazi jet, the first jet in the world, and it fought with ME-109s, Focke Wolf 190s. It still shows in its wings uh, a couple of uh, puncture holes in the wings uh, where it was shot at from below uh, on a mission where six of them went out and only two returned, and MJ-271 uh, was one of them. Had a very diverse... Uh, 
selection of pilots, 13 pilots flew it during the war. It came from all over the world. And I think this slide really shows you or gives you an idea of what a, a worldwide effort it was uh, and how all the Commonwealth came together uh, to fight the Nazis and to, to stop their advance into the UK and then to push them back. Henry Lacey Smith, this chap here, uh, I'll come on to him a little bit later because we spend a lot of time thinking we're going to fly over a lot of water. What happens if we, if we have to land on the water and what happens to a Spitfire in that scenario? And his story, if I don't say it, please remind me at the end, but his, but his story certainly guided us in the actions we'd need to take. So this is the Dutch scheme that the aeroplane was in in 2010. We actually bought the aeroplane in 2018 uh, from someone in Duxford who'd had it in store. Uh, that's exactly how it looked as we pushed it in. The only notable difference, clip wings. That wasn't correct for it for the, for the time it flew with the Royal Air Force. So the restoration uh, took two and a half years. Now, I'm not a wealthy man. This was my opportunity to, to own uh, half of a Spitfire. And everything I had went into it. Uh, I knew it was special, and I knew we were going to do something special with it. But when you push something like this into a hangar and think, I own a Spitfire, and then you come back four months later, and it's just bits all over the floor, believe me, your heart skips a beat. Uh, it was about another six months before it started coming back together again. And it took two and a half years to complete. One of the amazing, one of the briefs we gave to the guys who were doing it was that we, we're going to do this trip. It would be very easy to modernize the aircraft to, to enable us to do the trip. But we don't want to do that. We want to keep it as original as possible, yet still come up with ways of using more to, uh, wartime innovation to make the trip possible. And that's, I think, exactly what we did. Again, I'll come on to that in a moment. So the Spitfire was a, uh, an interceptor. It was built to, to, to create a wall around our country. So it was designed to, to take off, to fight for a short period of time, to stop the, uh, the enemy getting over our land, to push them back, and then to land back where they, uh, they took off from. The upshot of all of that is it didn't have much fuel on board. It wasn't designed to go a long way, the exact opposite of what we were wanting to do with it. However, later in the war, um, they used Spitfires for photo reconnaissance over, over Berlin and around the rest of Germany. And therefore, they'd made some modifications that we were able to then take and, and put into this standard Mark IX um, fighter. The key one of those was fuel. So a, a, a normal Spitfire carries 85 uh, gallons of fuel just in front of the pilot. We were able to get another 25 gallons into each wing and a further 66 gallons in two tanks behind the pilot. That meant a total of 202 gallons and meant that we were able to stretch the distances that we could fly from about 350 to 400 miles up to 1,000 nautical miles, which was absolutely crucial in some of the areas that, uh, that we went to. There are a couple of other bits and pieces if you want to have a read through. I'm not sure how many pilots there are in the room. Any? Some? few yeses? No? Good. <laughs> Means I can bullshit a bit more easily. <laughs> uh, the other thing, the other key thing that we did was added a, a sort of a, a, big, a big oil tank to it because the engine was going to potentially be running for up to five hours at any one time. We put oxygen on board. We were able to go up to 25,000 feet. That enabled us to get over weather if necessary. Um, Spitfires these days are capped at 10,000 feet. They don't want pilots taking oxygen, because the, particularly because the Spitfire oxygen systems were so dangerous back in the day. I don't think a great deal to talk about there, except we made a few... So this is where the gun sight would normally go. Uh, I've actually listened to some music there. I t we stopped in one place in Japan, and I told someone I'd watched a Netflix film on it on the way in, and then every single place we landed, they asked me what film I'd watched on the way here. <laughs> stupid, stupid mouth. 
Uh, I didn't watch any Netflix films, I promise, but I did listen to some music on the longer, on the longer legs. But this was primarily used for navigation. We had uh, some amazing kit. Everything we did in the cockpit was reversible. So we had two, you can see, non-wartime gauges here. Um, uh, that enabled us to potentially fly into bad weather if we needed to. That certainly wasn't the plan. Spitfire these days, so back in the day, they were able to fly in all sorts of conditions, of course. There were no limitations, but these days, we're only allowed to fly them in, uh, in visual conditions, which means you have to be able to see the ground or to be able to see a long way in front of you at all times, essentially. But we didn't know what we were going to encounter in many ways, so before leaving, we had to try and think of every eventuality. And, and, I, and I have to say, I had quite a few sleepless nights, or I woke up very, very early in the morning in a bit of a panic, thinking, what if? And, and that's where a lot of the solutions, or that's a lot of the problems, but also the solutions came. And having this kind of little bit of kit in here was, uh, was a huge part of that. Had we not had this, uh, I don't know what we'd have done when we were in India. Really bad smog in India, come on to later, but uh, ended up having to fly two ILS approaches into two of the airfields we went into. It wasn't just me that flew, there were three of us that flew, and the team was far bigger either than that photo, but this was the core team. Steve and I owned the business at the time. Um, Steve flew the Spitfire. Smithy, ex-officer commanding Battle of Britain Memorial Flight, ex-Red Arrows, we couldn't have had a better guy on the team to keep the, uh, keep the civilians in check. <laughs> Very true, he, he, he really is the definition of the sky god, this guy. He flew both the Pilatus and the Spitfire, but not at the same time, obviously. It's not that good. Uh, Jerry Jones, our engineer, had a massive job to do, looking after two aeroplanes around the world. This, Spitfires aren't supposed to leave the UK. They're, they're, the way they're certified means that they're pretty much only recognised in UK airspace. We flew through 26 different airspaces. We had to get approval to take this aeroplane through each of those based on... Uh, a lot of his work and a lot of the sort of work with the, with the CAA f to persuade them that it was a sensible thing for us to do and to, to educate them that the aeroplanes, and this one particularly, is extremely, was extremely well looked after. He also had to plan maintenance, so we have to do maintenance every 25 hours on the aircraft and we were doing three to four hours flying a day uh, with gaps in between for weather. Uh, and he had to get every place that we stopped at or might have stopped at uh, approved to do, to do this maintenance uh, just in case that's when the schedule came up. We did an enormous amount of training and uh, all of the military were absolutely superb to us, 100% behind the trip. They gave us every bit of training and kit they could possibly throw at us and to that extent we went through what essentially is a modern day f um, fighter pilot's sort of uh, survival training. So they threw us out, uh, this was on the 5th of January I think, down off the coast of Cornwall. Uh, it was the culmination of two days of training, pretty chilly. It snowed that night. We were, on the, we, were in the, uh, we were in the truck on the way back to the camp thinking, this is it, we've, we've finished. They pulled to the side of the road. Bob and Moore kicked us out and said, we'll pick you up in the morning. Thanks very much, guys. At which point, it started snowing. But we were flying over, you know, uh, maritime, polar, desert, jungle environments. And we had to have an idea, you know, mostly civilians, we had to have an idea of how to survive in, that, in those situations. Because, uh, you know, we're really blessed here with search and rescue, we're really blessed with the amount of people who are here to help us if something goes wrong. But you can't read that across to everywhere in the world. And, you know, a couple of idiots flying an old aeroplane around the world is potentially not as big news and as interesting in some of the countries we were going to. So we knew we had to look, be able to look after ourselves. And this played, this was a huge part in giving us the confidence that we were able to do that should something like that happen. This was that night. This was about uh, an hour and a half after we got there, so we're still smiling. It wasn't quite the same the next morning. They put us through some hypoxia training. Uh, as we were flying high, you have to be able to learn the... Uh, 
the effect that lack of oxygen has on you, hypoxia, uh, it's different for everyone. So they put you in a cockpit and they res restrict the amount of oxygen that you breathe in to then see what happens. And some people feel faint and some people lose color definition. Some feel, people feel euphoric. Uh, and we had to learn our own symptoms so that if we found ourselves in the airplane in that scenario, we could identify it before it got really dangerous. They put us in the Dunker uh, at Yeovilton. That was brilliant fun. Uh, really, really good. But then they, again, turned the, the lights off and did it so that even though we weren't flying at night, it gets pretty dark pretty quickly in the sea. And they, that, that dunker machine goes into the pool and then spins upside down. And, and then you have to get, it, get your straps off and get out. Smithy, I told you about earlier. So I did a lot of research on what happens to a Spitfire if you land in the sea. Uh, my background had been even the flight across the channel, the 20 miles across the channel, was a no-go in a warbird. If you did it, you did it very high, and you did it, you know, it was, it was kind of a silly thing to do. I looked at our map, and we had 1,800 miles in four days to cover just over the sea. So the idea of ditching the airplane in the sea sort of took up a, a huge part of my, my thinking power. And I, I looked at the RAF research that was done. They made balsa woods. Uh, models back in the 1940s, half size, and they, they looked at every airplane they built and see how to see how it would react if it landed in the sea. And the Spitfire had a really, really bad record in that respect. Essentially, it's going to flip on its back and go down very quickly. Okay, bad news. So, um, having really thought about it, uh, because you know, I, I'm 5,000 hours flying experience. Uh, I've never jumped out of an airplane. I've no experience of of parachuting. I didn't met, I've never met the person who packed the parachute I sit on. So the idea of jumping out of an airplane that still essentially works very well, it's just that the engine stopped turning. I couldn't get my head around that. But all, the, all, the, all of the, the data that I, that I got my hands on said, that's what you have to do, that's how to survive. So on the day that we turned up, Ian Smith, I mentioned, um, uh, I went up to him and said, just so you know, because you're flying a support aeroplane, if the engine fails on this aeroplane, uh, I'm going to jump out. And Smithy, cool as you like, expletive coming up, I, uh, I apologize in advance, was leaning against the wall, smoking a cigarette, threw it on the ground and went, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> so I flew the whole way around the world, still not knowing whether I was going to jump out if the engine failed or not. So <laughs> thank you, Mr. Sky God. Uh, this is all the kit the uh, Royal Air Force gave us. Uh, not only did they give us a standard kit, they designed a pack that we could, sit, that we could throw out of the back of the, of the, the PC-12, the support aeroplane we had, which was a complete clean sheet design. And, and really, they put a lot of effort into it and, and really brilliant of them, all supported by their, uh, you know, the, the commanding officers. I won't go into too much detail about that. This is the support aeroplane lent to us by a very, a very generous uh, Danish chap. Uh, had 20 hours on it when we got it. Brand, brand new. Uh, we had to spend some money to make this bit possible. And what that enabled was primarily to throw search and rescue equipment out to whoever was on the ground if we had that, that issue. But also to be able to do the filming of the trip and the, uh, the recording it photographically. And there's a, a nice shot over Greenland of uh, Ben Utley, who I didn't mention, actually, in the, uh, in the team photo earlier, uh, doing that. It's quite a strange thing, opening a door of an aeroplane, for people who've never been in aeroplanes before, it turns out. Anyway, on to the trip. Uh, we decided to go westbound. Uh, that's contrary to the direction that most trips uh, a go when they, when they circumnavigate the, the, the globe. The reason we did it, um, first of all, because we were flying in visual conditions, it enabled us to get through these areas here while it was still summer, but also meant that we could get to this area here in Asia bef um, when the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergence Zone, which comes with pretty torrential storms, had migrated south. Also, by going westbound, we gained an hour every day. Now, the reason most people go eastbound is because the prevailing wind is eastbound, but we were flying, for the most part, so low that the wind wasn't a massive factor for us. 
Uh, and in fact, we had a, about a, a 10 knot headwind net around the world, it turned out, which was fine. Main obstacles to overcome in planning, well, we've mentioned certification. Permits uh, were difficult. We left, when we left, two of the permits weren't in place, two of the places we didn't know we could go to. That was nerve-wracking. Uh, fuel, we started looking, uh, like having to plan fuel uh, a year in advance. And to give you an idea, on the east coast of Russia, uh, the, the guys that were helping us there said a year in advance, you need to know exactly how many barrels of fuel you're going to need in each place. And I'm like, a year in advance, that seems a bit over the top. Surely, you know, we can get them in by road if necessary, if we misplan it. And uh, he said, no, no, there are no roads. Okay. What about by boat? No, the, the seas froze, freeze over. So he was absolutely right. And uh, with six months to go, we had the, the number of barrels of fuel that we thought we were going to need in every place we might either go to or divert to on the east coast of Russia. And we had to also employ people to guard that fuel because fuel is very valuable and certainly in the kind of quantities that we were looking after it. In China, we didn't know how we were going to get through this part of the world here, even when we left. There's China there, just in here. Even when we left, we weren't sure how we were going to do that. Um, China wanted £100,000 just to talk about the possibility of it, so we decided that wasn't going to happen. Uh, but we're also told Hong Kong, no chance. Now, the most amazing thing, you know, I think they say the sun shines on the righteous, and there's a couple of times on this trip when I feel that was the case. I was, uh, we'd launched our Spitfire Simulator at Goodwood, uh, the Goodwood Revival, and uh, a friend of mine had brought a colleague of his in whose nephew he wanted to put in the simulator. So his colleague was about this tool, his nephew was about this tool, not sure what the relationship was, but anyway, he, uh, he got in, the, he got in the, uh, the simulator, and he was the first person to shoot down an ME109 in our simulator. And this chap and I were hugging each other and going, isn't this brilliant and isn't he great? And we got outside and he, this chap asked me, tell me a bit about the business. And I did. Uh, and then I told him about this trip. And he said, oh, you, are you coming to Hong Kong? And I said, well, we'd love to. We've told absolutely no chance. You know, no piston engine airplane has ever let, landed at Chet Black Cock, the new airport. Uh, and that's the only one you can land at. The only other one is military, and there's definitely no chance there. And he said, well, drop, drop me a note. I might be able to help. I said, well, I'm sorry. I, you know, we really have spoken to everyone we think we could. I said, well, maybe just drop me a note, and we'll, uh, I'll see what we can, well, maybe we can help. So I did, and it turned out he was the richest man in Hong Kong and owned half of the airport. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so quite, a, quite, a, quite an unbelievable chance meeting. And uh, landing into Hong Kong with seven Cathay Pacific airliners lined up by the side of the runway uh, with a load of sort of Chinese junks underneath. I was like, this is definitely not Chichester. <laughs> it was an incredible experience. Uh, I've mentioned the significant water crossings and uh, noise certificates. So I don't know why I put that in, to be honest. Japan was the other, the other place we had problems getting into, and that was because... So, so the Spit, this Spitfire in this country is run on a, a permit to fly. Uh, permit to fly is used on all sorts of other kind of experimental type aeroplanes. It just so happens that this is where the Spitfire fits within our legislation. Uh, five years before we went to Japan, another chap had been to Japan in a permit aircraft and uh, crashed on a golf course and didn't have the right kind of permissions in place and caused all sorts of problems for the British Embassy over there. So when we first picked up the phone to the British Embassy and went, permit to fly around the world, they were like, go away. Uh, but we managed to persuade them, and uh, with two days to go, we got our, our permission to land in Japan. Phew. Engineering planning, I've talked about a little bit. Uh, we, in terms of our sponsors and people we work with, we did a lot of fundraising for UNICEF. Very proud to have supported them in the trip. One of the key things, one of the key parts of the, or reasons for the whole trip was to fly the flag for the UK as well and to commemorate, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, to that end, we worked with the um, UK FCO uh, and in a number of the countries we went to, we engaged with 
schools and universities, veterans, etc., to tell them about the trip, to tell them about the aircraft, uh, and to really try and get some engagement with them. A very rewarding part of it, that actually, too. Some of the rest of our sponsors. IWC, by far the biggest part uh, in terms of sponsorship. Uh, kind of a shame to have a Swiss, apparently, name on the side of the Spitfire. Uh, it looks very German to me, but um, they, they made it possible. We went to them and said, we're going to do this trip and we don't need sponsorship, but if you want to get involved, then great. And then we saw some of the bills coming in and said, actually, uh, it would be really nice if you could help. <laughs> and Jack and Jones is the company that uh, the chap who owns this aeroplane owns, amongst others. They put on some really big, old-style parties for us to, to celebrate the fact that we were going on this trip and you know back in the day when people went went away and went on expeditions uh, there was a lot of this sort of stuff that went on it doesn't get done in quite the same style uh, this year uh, uh, these days I got to uh, I got to drive a Spitfire see I, actually I have done a presentation to a few more people than tonight I tell a lie I got to drive a Spitfire into a party of 800 people having dinner and then uh, do a small talk after that coolest moment of my life, by the way, except tonight, obviously. Uh, there were some notable people at that. I don't know if you recognize any of them. Anyway, time to go. We've done all the preparation. We are excited and nervous. We were trading this guy, um, Dave Williams, uh, astronaut, as you can see, uh, to fly the Spitfire. And he came into the office and he said, how are you feeling, Matt? And I said, uh, to be honest, Dave, I'm pretty nervous. I feel like we have done all the preparation we can, so I feel like we're ready. Uh, but I feel like running, to be honest. And he said, uh, sit down, let me tell you what it feels like to strap yourself to the top of a rocket. <laughs> <laughs> I, won't, I won't go into what he said, but I, I left the room with a tail between my legs thinking, this is fine, we've got parachutes and we're pretty close to the ground. So... <laughs> Thank you, Dave, for that pep talk. Huge turnout on the day. Uh, it was a splendid event that I didn't really see any of because we were so focused on, on going. And this is the moment just prior to departure. I put these slides in just to give you a sense of the kind of scale of, of the, of the send-off they gave us. So we're off. The weather cleared, it wasn't a great start in Goodwood, but by, the, by midday it cleared up really nicely and throughout the whole country. And uh, we made it up to Lossiemouth and then got stuck there for five days. It was incredibly frustrating because you, you've got all this momentum behind you and you think you're on your way and then suddenly the weather plays a, plays a big part in slowing you down. Um, but finally got out of here. We had said right from the outset... Let me tell you, let me show you this photo. So, Coningsby put up a, a two seat typhoon for us just to give us a, uh, a nice send off, which was very good of them. We said right from the outset this is a VFR aeroplane, so we need to be able to see where we're going. At no point on this trip will we fly the aircraft where you can't see the ground or the sea. Flight number two. Well done, guys. We'd be so frustrated with five days, and this was this became a huge part of the of the trip. And you know, we're motivated to go every day, but you still have to make good aviation decisions not to risk your life because nothing's worth nothing's worth that. But there's this go-itis thing that you, we just you know we've got to get going, we've got to get going, and we rationalised at the time that this was the right thing to do, and we made it. So you know maybe it was, but we had no idea. We had no idea how low these clouds went over the sea. So we had no idea if I had to you know, fly the aircraft and ditch the aeroplane, which I still didn't know whether I was going to do or not, obviously. Um, still didn't know what sort of conditions that had underneath for us. So it wasn't the smartest, but I think that's part of being on an expedition. What we tried to do initially was take the rules that we use day in, day out, and apply them to the, to the expedition. But the reality was that when you're pushing the boundaries, doing something like this, some of those little elements have to, um, have to give way slightly. Anyway, when we got to the Faroe Isles, the weather had cleared up. 
And what a beautiful place that is. And that is the few places we went to on the trip, a few at most I'd been to before, but this is one I will definitely, definitely go back to and so close to home. What a stunning, stunning place. Same day into Iceland, landed in Iceland, again stuck for three days. Uh, the local airline there um, took us off to, in fact, they put us on two aeroplanes that were going to Kulasuk. So Kulasuk is on the east coast of, uh, is on the east coast of, um, where are we going? On the east coast of Greenland here. It's a gravel, gravel runway. Um, it's got an air, it's got a tower there, so air traffic control, no radar or anything. Uh, it's pretty bleak and there's no real sort of diverts anywhere else along the coast there. So we needed to know pretty much on the day that we set off from Iceland, from Reykjavik here, that we were going to make it across the Denmark Straits here and make it into here. We waited three days. Uh, we've been on the ground such a long time. We got on, got on really well with these airline crew. They'd put Smithy and I in the front of two separate airliners and taken us over there with passengers in the back, which I didn't think they were allowed to do anymore, but obviously they can in Iceland. They showed us the runway. They showed us the environment. That was super helpful. Anyway, the next day we were ready to go. We took off. Beautiful weather the whole way across. In the Spitfire, we were sponsored by Iridium, and we had a, a satellite phone. And uh, so I was able to call ahead to the Kulasuk Tower and say, weather's lovely here, it's forecast to be lovely there, just checking in with you, making sure that's the same. And this very droll Danish guy would come back and say, hello, the weather is very good, no wind, no problem, see you in an, an hour and a half. Every 25 minutes I called him back, saying, by the, by, by the time we got 25 minutes away, we knew each other pretty well. Hey Matt, how are you? How's the weather? No wind. Weather's good. There's fog over the far end of the airfield. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> so those of you who don't know much about aviation, fog's really bad when you're trying to see an airfield. You can probably figure that out. So I said to him, so, uh, so how likely is it to... to um, you know, to, to have moved, and how long do you think it might be in your experience? He goes, well, I have no idea, Matt. Oh, well, how long have you worked there? Uh, I can't remember his name, Klaus. How, have you worked there? how long have you worked there, Klaus? He said, um, 15 years. Okay, so in your 15 years' experience, when you've seen this before, how long has it taken? He goes, it varies. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so we've got just enough fuel to get there, have a look, and if we can't get in, turn around and go back. Probably. Probably. Anyway, we pushed on and uh, we got in. And you can actually see the fog there just approaching the field. So normally you'd take off and land. There was actually about five knots of wind. You'd normally take off and land into wind, but I had to take off, uh, land uphill into wind, but take off downhill and out of wind, which in a, in a tailwheel aeroplane isn't very comfortable. And particularly with one and a quarter times more fuel on board than it was designed for. This was really the first time we kind of got into the trip and thought, we're in some really cool places now. We're seeing some places that, you know, not many people have seen before. And then we pushed on. So covered about 800 nautical miles that day. Weather looked good for the crossing across the, uh, across the uh, Greenland itself. Uh, it's pretty cold, minus 15 degrees in the cockpit. Uh, it was at 14,000 feet because the ice where we were is at 8,000 feet. Had oxygen available if required. I took the odd suck on it, uh, but I was pretty, you know, pretty keen to get where we were, get where we were going. The weather's pretty nice the whole way, which was great. Um, but it's very, very difficult to judge depth perception. Another story I can tell you in the bar afterwards about that. But anyway, so it's, it's, it's an in, it's a it's an interesting environment to fly in. And we were tired by now, but had no idea that these things existed, these cobalt lakes on the west coast of Greenland. And suddenly, that, that picture is undoctored. That's exactly the color they were. So we've just been white for an hour and a half and cold, and suddenly this unbelievable vista. Actually, the first time we'd, um, first time we'd opened the door on the aeroplane to take some, to take some photos as well on the, on the support aircraft. 
In fact, one of the guys, that Lachlan Munro, who I didn't mention in the team, who's this kind of overall team manager, he'd never done any formation flying before, and I was, I was flying alongside him, uh, or alongside the Pilatus, and, uh, and I'd never seen someone double-take in such a, such a brilliant way. We got down on the ground and said, that's the most, he said, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. He said, but why didn't you look where you were going? I said, well, if you're formation flying, you kind of have to look at the aeroplane that you're trying not to hit. <laughs> anyway, this was in Greenland, just a couple of shots to take you through as we moved from the kind of ice flow back into the obvious land. Uh, Ikaliwit to Nome, again, we got caught. Weather again, we were supposed to be meeting up with the Red Arrows in Gatineau to do a display with them. We blew that. Uh, great shame. Uh, we got stuck in a Caliwit. The accommodation we booked for one night uh, in night five. I think if, we, if we'd stayed another night, we'd have been sleeping in a tent. But in night five, we ended up in some barracks. I've no idea where they were or how they managed to fit us in there, but it's pretty remote up here. Uh, we were keen to get away. Again, we made a bad decision uh, on weather. Got airborne, full fuel. Uh, expecting an, an improvement as we continued, and actually the, the cloud base came, came down and down, meaning we had to return to Ikaluit to land. By the time when we left, it was 1,000 feet overcast. By the time we got back, it was 400 feet overcast. That's not very much room between the ground and the top of the clouds. And landing this aeroplane with uh, nearly 200 gallons of fuel on board changed the approach speed from 85 miles an hour to 125 miles an hour. So it was, uh, it was an exciting moment that we, again, learned a lot from. But we made it in the end. In fact, here, in Europe and in the States, the amount of information you get as a pilot is phenomenal. In the States, you have everything piped into the cockpit. Here, there's a lesser version of that. But everything you get on the ground before you get into the aircraft gives you this amazing situational awareness of the environment that you're about to, you're about to go out and embark into. Very soon, we realized that wasn't the case around the rest of the world. So we were having to make decisions on whether to fly distances of four, five, six, seven hundred 700 nautical miles a day, which is the length of the south coast of the UK up to the Faroe Isles, and think of the different weather patterns we get in that. And we were having to make those decisions based on prognostic charts and SIG weather charts. So it became, it became really quite difficult, which is part of the challenge, obviously. We left to Caluit, having made the wrong decision initially, but got down to Kujiwak with what looked like it was going to be a lovely day and a tower guy here who said, yeah, the weather's beautiful. Two and a half hours down here, we thought we were going to be clear to the moon, down at 1,500 feet in rain. But there's something called a, um, a TAF and a METAR, which is an aviation report and forecast, and it's broadcast over certain frequencies that you can pick up in the, air, in the airplane. And we were getting those, and it was saying the weather's beautiful. Essentially, it's sunny, and it's at least 10,000 feet of cloud base. But that wasn't what we were experiencing. We spoke to the tower, and he said, I'm not, I, I don't really know what the cloud base is. Anyway, we were able to get in, landed. And he came on the, he came on the tower, and he said... Um, that's a matter of interest. What was the cloud base and visibility, do you think? And I said, well, maximum 1,500 feet overcast and probably about 5K visibility. He goes, brilliant. I'll update the forecast in the METAR report. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> and that's what we had to deal with. It was a completely different playing environment. This was in Canada, a lot of trees there. So a bit of R&R, &R. we stopped in Gatineau with a chap who owns lots of warbirds. He also had a, 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 a um, beaver on floats, that's the name of the aeroplane, and a beautiful house by the side of this lake. So we spent a day up there, which was utterly charming of him. And this is Gertie in his hangar with some of the, his aeroplanes. Big day, this. So we made it, we left Gatineau into the States, and uh, obviously the US has some you know, pretty horrific history with aeroplanes flying in this area. Uh, but amazingly, their airspace is still very free, and without any prior permission, we were able to fly past here and fly up the Hudson River at 1,000 feet. Um, putting these two symbols of freedom together was a very, very special moment. 
uh, and meant an enormous amount. And it was a real sort of sign that we'd, we'd moved, that we'd left the UK. We'd gone past a lot of rocks, a lot of trees, a lot of water. But now we were, now we were physically somewhere that you know, we were used to seeing on TV all the time. And we'd actually achieved something at this point. We carried across America um, and stopped with a guy who owned who owns lots and lots of warbirds. He's, in, he's flying one of those Mustangs in his 100,000-acre ranch in Texas. In fact, we had a problem with the, uh, with the temperature gauge, uh, which meant that uh, we weren't able to tell what temperature the coolant was, which is really important when you're managing a Merlin engine. Uh, we stopped halfway, went to a Walmart, got a chicken temperature thermometer thing, st strapped that to one of the pipes around the engine bay, in the engine bay, put an electronic readout in the cockpit just to give us some idea. Spoke to this chap, Dan. He said, come and see me. We'll, we'll, we'll help you out. Landed. The part we needed, he didn't have, but it was in another of his Spitfires a 1,000 miles away. He brought one of his private jets in to take our engineer to take that gauge out of the Spitfire to fly it back down for us. Our engineer no longer works for us, obviously. He now works for Dan. <laughs> Not true, but he would. <laughs> Some incredible vistas in the States. What an amazing country it is to fly over. Uh, this is Sedona, so very near the Grand Canyon. And a, and a great shot, apparently completely illegal, but a great shot uh, of us flying past the Hollywood sign. We were so disappointed this day when we, got to the, when we got to the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, but actually I think it makes it quite a poignant photo. And uh, I've seen many, many shots of, the air, of aircraft against this bridge, but none so recognizable when so little of it is actually uh, is so little, is visible. This was uh, Mount Rainier, I think, in, uh, in Oregon. And then this is in Canada as we're moving up north through Canada on the uh, uh, western side. One of the, one of the, when, we, when we started planning the route and where we were going to go, when we spoke to people in Alaska, they said, you need to be through here and out by the 15th of September. 15th of September is basically when the weather starts changing and you could get caught in a week's worth of snow. Not only can you not fly in the snow, but that also puts a lot of the airfields out. So we were always pushing time to try and get up there. We actually had the weather through the western part of the U.S. was perfect. We barely saw any clouds the whole way up there. It was a fantastic part of the trip in terms of ease of flying and great information. Right, I've been droning on for a bit. I've got a video I'd like to show you. Um, it's got some clips in it. It really, really to sort of stop the monotony of my voice, but... Um, Ben, who videoed the entire thing, uh, found a girl or met a girl at a wedding who was playing a guitar and said, you are brilliant, would you write a song for the movie we're, we're making about this trip? And she wrote this in 30 minutes. Uh, it was done during lockdown. He put a score together and got the Czech Philharmonic Orchestra to record it. They did this in one take. Talk about talent, honestly. Apparently they turn up in a day and there's probably 10 or, t 10 or 15 pieces of music they open the page, what's one? They, all 100 of them play their bit, what's next? Just mind-blowing, mind-blowing talent. Anyway, I'm only, I'm only really showing you this because uh, I like some of the footage and I hope you do too. Cool. If you're cool with that, we'll do the fireworks again.
So here next really came the, the, the most exciting, the most terrifying, uh, the most obvious part of the trip where we thought, we are a long, long way from home here now. Crossing from Nome, Alaska, uh, across the Bering Straits and hearing a Russian voice uh, on the radio was, was terrifying and cool at the same time. What really struck me about this part of the world or this part of Russia was just how barren it was and just how big. You know, we were flying, as you can see there, 400, 500, 300, 400, 400 again miles a day and seeing nothing. No sign of human inhabitation whatsoever. No tracks, no huts, no roads, just bare nothing. And then landing in places that uh, had 500 people in the maximum. Um, when we did the planning for this part, none of these airports, one or two of them were, but most of the airports weren't even on aviation charts. So I had to go into Google, look for an area that looked like there were people there, presume that there might be an airport near those people, find those places that were, and then hand these Google photos to our, to our Russian aide and say, it looks like there's an airport there, can we land there? And off the back of that, we were able to get permission to go. When we first looked at this part of the, uh, of the trip, it looked like we wouldn't get through here because the airplane simply didn't have the range. And with 1,000 nautical miles, the plan was not that we flew 1,000 nautical miles. The plan was that we flew 470 nautical miles so that on the, in those places where we had no diver, no alternate, we could turn around and go back. 
So finding those, finding those airfields was really important. First place we landed in, Anadir, front, front line of Cold War Soviet Union defense. Uh, quite an amazing place. In the, we didn't actually, but this is how nice our hotel was. <laughs> it was the most rundown place I've ever seen. It was just amazing. And it looked like, it looked like a bell had rung and people had just left because there were cases and shoes and all sorts of human artifacts that you think you would take with you when you left somewhere that were just left here. So quite what happened, I don't know, but um, it was very, very interesting being there. A bear's there as well. I was going to go for a run, but someone advised strongly against that. Just to give you, I put one photo in of this thousands and thousands of miles of barren land. We landed in a place called Okotsk. Um, had a metal runway. That was a surprise. Uh, I've not really met anyone who, other than, I, I think in, in the military, some runways in sort of forward operating bases are made out of runway, are made out of uh, metal, but this was, a, this was a huge surprise to us. Uh, actually, no problem for the Spitfire. Pilatus didn't like it at all, threw up all sorts of, of, uh, of warnings. This trip here from Ivensk to Magadan over these mountains was the most frightening part of the whole trip for me. Uh, it was supposed to be an hour and 20 minute flight. Again, no idea what the weather is like. Again, trying to make the most out of prognostic charts. In fact, we even had people back in the UK, military weather guys in the, in the UK, helping us, trying to tell us what we were gonna, what we were gonna encounter. I flew 44 of the 74 flights on this trip, and for 42 of them, I thought I was the luckiest man in the world. For two of them, and this one being the most obvious, I wished I was anywhere else in the world. We got stuck between two weather layers uh, in very cold temperatures, which meant we couldn't go into cloud because we get icing and there's no de-icing capability on a Spitfire. Uh, there were mountains poking through the layer below us, so I knew if I jumped out, if something went wrong, that was gonna be bad, and that if I try, if I had an engine failure, uh, and had to go down, and that was going to be bad too, because I had to go through cloud before hoping to find somewhere flattish to put this aeroplane. Um, we spent two and three quarter hours trying to find a way around here. With no, when we left here, it was starting to get a bit misty. You get that feeling in the air of the, the high moisture content, and it was starting to get a big, bit misty. We had a Russian interpreter on board. I think he was just there to make sure we weren't doing anything dodgy because he did not speak a word of English. It was utterly useless. He probably, knew, he probably knew what the weather was doing. He couldn't tell us. He couldn't even draw pictures of it. Uh, I had found out just before we left for the trip that my other half was, was um, expecting my, our, first, uh, our first baby. And... Uh, I <laughs> I remember in that bit there thinking, what am I doing? I might never meet him. This is absurd. Anyway, we found a way around. We found a way around and we landed and it was the best beer or two I have ever, ever had. Pushed on from here, Magadan, Okotsk, I, I mentioned, into a place called Nikolaevsk. Woke up in the morning in Nikolaev's got a call from my other half saying that uh, she was bleeding and <laughs> sorry and she was very scared and the ambulance couldn't find her where we live uh, to take her to hospital and she was worried about our baby I have never felt so selfish in my life sat on the east coast of Russia in the middle of nowhere doing this boy's own adventure thing and there she was back there. Anyway, upshot of the story is baby was fine, she got to hospital. Bearing in mind what I'd said about the kind of the environment here, Smithy at this point put his arms around me and said, you take the Pilatus, take everyone else back, take the route we're going to take, the weather here wasn't good enough for the Spitfire to go. I'll make it work. 
I'll make this bit work on my own. So I flew from here to here, cleared customs here, took about five hours, flew into Chitose, dumped the Pilatus there, got into a commercial flight inland to Tokyo and got a flight home. Uh, I was home in 48 hours from having heard the, heard the news. Smithy did, this, did these legs and then actually a bit further down on his own and had some horrific weather to deal with. In fact, he had, is it, uh, I think it was Hagbis, um, to deal with the, uh, the typhoon that went through there at that stage. I ended up on the floor of the hospital, jet-lagged, so awake at 3 o'clock in the morning with my son still in my other half, but with a heart monitor on him, with his heart dropping down to sort of 30 beats a minute and then coming back up to 100 again, thinking that doesn't seem good. And then on my phone, I was watching Smithy on the flight tracker descending for 5,000 feet, 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000, come on Smithy, 500 feet, 300 feet, still 40 miles, an hour from, 40 miles away from an airport. I'm like, this is very, very stressful. I'd rather be in the aeroplane. <laughs> and it, anyway, uh, Smithy made it, and Arthur was born, so everything worked out well. But I'm rambling a bit now. Let's get on with this. So I mentioned this bit. In through Japan, really bad weather, amazing people. Probably the, the best reaction we got um, from the whole trip. Uh, in one hangar, we went to, I think there was something like 5,000 people waiting to see the aeroplane. Never felt like such a rock star. We turned up in a taxi, and we had, they had to sort of part the, part the queue to allow us through, and then and they came in and listened to us afterwards talk about the trip. It was uh, sensational. An amazing part of the world, incredible people. Unbelievable how much the war has changed that country and the way and the way they are. They were, you know, they had a pretty pretty bad reputation for the way they behaved during the war. They have completely changed. Uh, it was fascinating to hear what an effect it had, and what an amazing place to fly a vintage warbird, knowing that the history in this area, you know. Spitfires and Mustangs all the way around here and flew at different times during the war and after the war. This bit here was the uh, longest really over water bit we did. And going from Taichung to Hong Kong was the first time I had a problem with the Spitfire. Uh, slight rumble. Ooh. Uh, so the engineering side of my mind is like, it's bound to be a plug, bound to be a plug, just a gummed up plug, it's just a plug. The catastrophic side of my mind was like, that's the first side of, uh, of, of, of total destruction. Uh, don't touch anything. But I'll actually I'll try that, see if I can identify what's wrong. Anyway, it was a plug. Uh, but it was uh, an hour and a half of really... Um, quite terrifying over water flying before, before landing into Hong Kong. I mentioned the Hong Kong bit earlier. Having got there, I'd done my bit of over water for, for a few days. So I jumped in the Pilatus and Smithy flew this leg to Da Nang, which was 570 nautical miles. Bear in mind that the, he was the officer commanding Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. He, it was him that said flying over the channel 22 miles is nuts. He flew 568 nautical miles <laughs> <laughs> across there. So he's a sky god, but he's also an idiot, which makes me love him. Uh, we landed in Da Nang, and this part of the world was where we really started doing the, the kind of the um, waving the British flag bit, where Spitfires had been very active uh, from 1943, 1944 onwards, uh, particularly at the end of the war in all of this area. Uh, there are apparently Spitfires buried in Myanmar and Burma. Uh, certainly when we were in Bangkok, we were taken to see a few that are in the museum there and some that are in their stores. So this, this was an amazing area to, to, to fly that aeroplane over. Landing into Calcutta, we were going to land in um, 
Chittagong here in Bangladesh, but the weather wasn't good enough, but fortunately had enough fuel to carry on into Calcutta. That's the first, uh, that's the first ILS I flew in the Spitfire, and I, I'm not sure that it's not the first ILS that anyone's ever flown in a Spitfire, to be honest. Uh, good news is, Spitfire does, like everything it does, uh, ILS is an instrument landing system, so it's basically the system that an airliner uses predominantly to land at airfields whenever you've been on board. We put one in on this, as I said earlier, just to give us that opportunity if necessary. There was really, really bad smog in the whole of the north of India. It's always bad there, but particularly bad. And it wasn't for cloud or anything that I had to use it. It was the visibility due to the, due to the smog. Very warm. Uh, for those who knew anything about flying, I configured the airplane, put the flaps down, put the gear down. Flew slightly faster than I normal, normally would, so I could see over the nose of the Spitfire, so that when the run, runway appeared, I'd be able to see it. I thought, my God, this is doing this, is doing this hands off. This is nicer than landing the airplane normally. This is fantastic. And then I looked at the temperature gauge and saw that I was about three degrees away from cooking the engine because I had the flaps down that were covering the covering the radiators and I had the gear down that was doing the same thing. So I then had to put everything up and I flew the rest of the approach looking into the sky, not being able to see anything. Anyway, it worked out. Uh, it shut down just after we landed. One of the questions a lot of people ask us about this trip is, you know, how do you manage a Merlin engine in this scenario? Spitfires are notorious for overheating. Well, this is a Mark 9 Spitfire for starters, so a slightly later variant. Uh, Gertie was built in 1943. Uh, the Mark 9s had two radiators under the wing, so their ability to deal with uh, temperatures was far, far better than the, the babies, the Mark 1s, Mark 2s, Mark 5s. Nonetheless, we were operating in some temperatures, so in Mandalay here in 45 degrees, an incredible humidity. But the airplane did extremely well. We developed a technique that was basically taxiing and moving when we could and then just shutting down every time we got to a place where we had to stop. And by doing that, um, never really had an issue with overheating. We did have a problem with the brakes. The brakes got very hot very quickly, and Spitfire brakes aren't very good anyway. Uh, so I had to manage those, and a couple of times we went kind of veering off the run off, not off the runway, but off the taxiways. We had to shut the engine down, stop, wait, start up again, and then use the brakes once they cooled down a bit to, to get where we were supposed to be going. But for the most part, the aeroplane not only handled the heat, but actually the whole trip unbelievably well, considering its age, considering the age of its technology. Shot over Japan. Some of the people in one of the hangars in Japan. Shot on the ground in Vietnam, and just see the humidity and the storms building behind. This was one of the events we did. <laughs> this is great. So I got up and, uh, and did a, again, in fact, Smithy did this talk. So maybe, I don't know, 100, probably not, maybe 100 students there from the engineering school. Uh, he stands up and says, right, this is the team, this is what we're doing, gave a really eloquent introduction for about five minutes and then said, so who here loves the Spitfire? Absolute quiet, a lot like this. Absolute, <laughs> absolute quiet. Okay, he thinks, okay, they're engineering students, maybe, they're, uh, maybe it's the engine they're interesting. Who here loves the Merlin engine? Same response. To which a little voice at the back and then says, uh, Captain Smith, Captain Smith, no one here speak English. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we waved the flag. They understood that. This is in Myanmar. Just beautiful, just, just beautiful. I don't know if I've said it enough on, uh, in, in delivering this uh, today, but seeing the planet and seeing what it has to offer and the different landscapes, you know, I've, I've done a lot of it from a jet and you feel quite disconnected from it, it, you know. But if you do it low level and you do it out of an aeroplane that's got a bubble canopy and you can see all around you, that's special. But you do it over a, you look over the wing of a Spitfire and see our planet, God, what an honor, whew. 
This was in Myanmar, getting in in the 45 degree heat. So we're getting closer to home now. We, Jodhpur is, the, I learnt, the home of aviation in India. The Maharaja there invited us up to his palace, put on two nights for us, not just the one, uh, and inducted us into an aviation hall of fame they have there, which was a great, great honour. Came down and saw us um, uh, at the airfield as well. Showed us some of their firepower. This, was the, this is the palace here, Umen Barwad, I think it's called, uh, and some of their MiGs. This was the uh, Maharaja here, and this is the this is the original, the first aviation clubhouse I think in India. It's a great history there, and of course, Indians had um, flew Spitfires uh, during the war, and then had them in India after the war. And there's a shot over the palace as on the day we left. We then went into Gurdaspur, Pakistan. So left India, which was an incredibly colourful, incredibly beautiful, totally disorganised place. And then landed in Pakistan, which was, I thought, going to be the same. Um, incredibly well organised, almost clinical in the airport. Not so much outside, but uh, Karachi was a bit frightening. A lot of a very obvious uh, military presence. Uh, a lot of tanks around. So we, we left there as quickly as possible, stopped in a place called Pazni, and then stayed the night, Pazni to get some fuel, and then stayed the night in Gurdar. There's one hotel in Gurdar, and, well, you can read what happened here, but basically four people were killed six months prior. They hadn't even fixed the hotel, so when we checked in, there were bullet holes and broken glass all over the outside of it. It was quite a frightening evening, um, particularly as one of, the, uh, one of the team had someone come into their room at one o'clock in the morning, <laughs> by accident, apparently. So we got out of there as quickly as we possibly could, and then into Abu Dhabi. Again, beautiful scenery, absolutely exquisite. The landscape just kept changing below us. The, the, the desert in the parts of Pakistan that we flew over were a very kind of dusty, uh, light colour. And then we went into Abu Dhabi and it started getting, started getting like a redder sand. In Bahrain, the uh, Crown Prince looked after us very well, put us up in one of his hotels, play, paid an enormous amount of interest in the trip. Bahrain sponsored six Spitfires during World War II for the war effort. Um, uh, and so they have a, a great affection for the aircraft. Um, into Kuwait, uh, that F-18 was very, very, very close to me. So much so that over the sound of the, in, of the Merlin, I could hear his engine. Smithy was flying the Pilatus, and he just said, do not move an inch, Matt. <laughs> so of course I had to have a look. We were actually at that point flying over. I think it's just out of shot. So just down here was the uh, UK embassy and they had all the dignitaries outside for us flying over the top of them. One of my favorite flights on the whole trip was from Kuwait, well actually probably Kuwait to Jordan over Saudi Arabia and then from Saudi Arabia up to Egypt. The changing landscape and the pure scale of the place, again, just blew me away. This was over, or very close to Wadi Rum, uh, uh, one of the places where Star Wars was filmed, if you recognise the, the kind of the topography. I asked Smithy, I said, look, I'm going to peel off and go low level a little bit around here if you don't have any objections. So I did, and it was great, great fun. Uh, the next day, we met up with these guys, uh, Jordanian Falcons, and flew very close to Aqaba. And I said, why don't we go back over to Wadi Rum? There's some amazing, amazing vistas and backdrops there. And they were like, it's absolutely forbidden to fly low level <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, a nice shot grabbed by Ben out the back of the Pilatus. It's on the ground in Aqaba. 
So as I said just now, we left, we left Aqaba in Jordan and flew uh, up into Egypt. Um, Egypt, so much to offer in terms of rich history, going back thousands and thousands of years, but also wartime history. Right from the outset, we wanted to get the photo. I've just blown the story, but we wanted to get the, the photo of the Spitfire over the pyramids. And they said, you can't, we just can't do it. That airspace is, is, is sacred, you know, if you're at 30,000 feet maybe, but, but not low level. So we left Aqaba, beautiful sort of salt blue seas, saw the uh, Suez Canal, the landscape, in the video, there's a landscape that was shot from above. That was over, that was over Egypt, over the you know, very Martian-like um, uh, terrain. So keen to fly around. So you can see the, the green of the Nile Delta there on the left-hand side of the photo. Um, but so keen to fly the Spitfire in this theatre around Alexandria where Spitfires had, uh, had ended up flying later on in the war, such a you know, huge part of the war, of war history. But really, really wanted to get this shot over the pyramid. So we tried our luck again and said to the air traffic controller, look, we'd really love to fly over the pyramids. Any chance we can get a photo? And he's like, no, you can't fly this vector. I'm like, okay, fair enough. And he gave us vectors. So he put us straight over the top. He knew he couldn't be recorded on the radio giving us a vector to fly over. So he told us we couldn't, but then gave us these, uh, these headings so that we knew we, we could. Our uh, cameraman was asleep in the back and got the biggest dig in the ribs of all time when we realised, because of course he couldn't tell us we were going near and we didn't know exactly where the pyramids were, so one of us spotted it and said, get Ben up as soon as possible, then had to depressurise the Pilatus, open the door, etc. And he managed to get some footage and quite a nice still, I think, as well. Nearly home. Greece again, that was, a, that was a huge moment, landing there, having left, having left Egypt and, uh, and landing in Greece. We're in Europe. We've nearly made this, guys. You know, perchance to dream. Let's not, let's not get too carried away, but we are only a few flights away from having done this, having done something that so many in our industry said couldn't, couldn't happen. So landed in Greece, landed in, uh, in Heraklion, in Crete, and then one night in, in Athens, into Italy. Had to stay in Padova for two or three days. This was the last part of the trip that was causing us any kind of consternation in terms of weather, the Alps, getting over the Alps in winter. It's now uh, sort of first week in December. Uh, very, very foggy in this part of the world. Um, I don't know whether you're aware, but a lot of expeditions back in the day used to start or finish in Venice. I think most of them started in Venice. So we wanted to go to Venice as a sort of cap doth to, to that. Uh, so stayed in Padova, went into Venice, had a really nice couple of days there, waiting for the weather to clear. And then finally it did. Got over the Alps, spectacular to fly over the Alps and into, into Germany. I've flown a Spitfire before in Germany, so I wasn't too nervous about, uh, about doing it. But it was quite a good story the first time I did it, because I was nervous that time. Um, I was flying an aeroplane from the UK up to Norway and crossed from, I think, the Dutch border, I guess, into, into German airspace. And I gave them all the details, and the guy said, uh, say again your aircraft type. <laughs> <laughs> And, I, and I, I sunk down a little bit in my seat, even though no one could see me. I don't know why. I said, <coughs> Spitfire. I mean, very good. Didn't say, didn't, say, didn't say another thing for 10 minutes until, I had to, until he had to hand me over to the next, the next frequency somewhere else in Germany. He said, Spitfire Golf India Lima Delta Alpha. Contact uh, Paderborn 121.490. Please don't drop any bombs on us. <laughs> thought, very good. And the next guy came up and he said, uh, Spitfire, huh? So which came first, the beer or the aeroplane? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I wasn't too nervous as a result of this about, um, about flying into Germany. And particularly poignant on that previous trip, actually, was that 
someone had come up to me and said, look, we've been watching you on Facebook where you're going, and pretty much everywhere you've been to probably uh, records this aircraft as the saviour of their nation. But in many ways, it was the saviour of our nation as well, because we weren't all Nazis. I thought that was a really interesting insight, and one I hadn't considered. Anyway, we went to Berlin, and then we ended up in Lelystadt. Now, the reason we stopped in Lelystadt, because that's where MJ271, Silver Spitfire, Gertie, had spent most of her life in a museum. And the guy who sort of tarted her up to museum standard for presentation uh, to museum standard uh, is still alive. And we thought it would be really nice to reintroduce him to his Spitfire. And we took him up in the PC-12 so that he could see it flying alongside. Uh, we got up on the day we were meant to leave, uh, had a big party arranged in Goodwood. Weather there was great. Woke up to freezing fog here. Not great news. It was, it was planned to clear, and fortunately it did, but only gave us a half an hour window to get out. So Pilatus took off. I took off. I did one circuit and a wing waggle for, for Harry, the, the chap who had restored the aircraft. Uh, and then tried to catch the Pilatus. One of the biggest things I haven't mentioned on this trip, which I'll come to in a moment, is the way fatigue affect us all, affected us all. And it's something we just didn't conceive of in planning it. You know, we knew we'd get tired, but that constant waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning, what's the weather like, are our permissions in place, will there be fuel there, every day for four months really took its toll. But we're nearly home. Great. I see the Pilatus in the distance, and I'm at you know, a high power setting. I thought, right, I need to bleed some of the speed off to affect a formation join. Uh, and I pulled the long re wrong lever in the cockpit and I turned the engine off. So I was trained by military guys to fly these aeroplanes, and they, they taught me this thing called limitation operation indication. And what that essentially is, is there's a limitation. Make sure you're doing that before you move the, you know, do whatever you're trying to do. Operate it, and don't take your hand off the lever until you get the result that you're expecting. So the engine went quiet. I'm knackered. I look around the cockpit going, engine stop, bad. Where's my hand? Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Put it forward again. Engine started. Thank the Lord, because that would have been massively embarrassing with less than 150 miles to go to have uh, put, it in the, put it in the actually channel there. What it did do was give me a massive, massive burst of adrenaline, and I think I needed that to get through the next bit. The most poignant part of the entire trip for me was the first time I saw the White Cliffs. I'm not putting myself in the same place of any of those brave souls that fought for us all back in the day. But in that moment, I knew what it felt like to have been away for a long time and not been 100% assured of coming back and see our homeland in front of us and see those white cliffs. Now, I have, as you've seen a couple of times today, I get quite emotional about, about this stuff. Uh, I've lost it around Spitfires and with Spitfire people many, many times. But it's, this is the first time I actually cried in the aeroplane. It was an extraordinarily emotional moment, both the poignancy of us being home, but also comparing it to, you know, back in the day and what these pilots, what these men saw every day coming home to land for one more day. And then the boyhood dream bit, the red arrows. And I heard over the red, you know, red arrows, visual spitfire, I cleared them to join me flew them all the way along the coast and had that beautiful, amazing red arrows, smoke on, go! <laughs> <laughs> and then watched, and then watched as, the, uh, as they both uh, started streaming white smoke. I knew both of the pilots as well personally, which was a really nice part of it. Managed to get them straight over the top of, uh, of Goodwood as well without doing a turn from 20 miles out, which I was very proud of. And then we were home. There's Arthur. Slept through the whole thing.
So what were the biggest challenges? Well, weather I've discussed, weather reporting we've talked about, permissions, really hard, took a really, really long time and a lot of work to get permissions for each country. Inner tube issues I haven't mentioned. We had numerous problems using new inner tubes in these old aeroplanes purely because we can't get the original specification for them. And it actually caused Steve to come off the runway in India in one place. Uh, incredibly, the, uh, the tyre stayed on the rim and the rubber protected the rim, so there was no damage whatsoever done to the aircraft. Uh, it's quite dangerous coming off the side of a runway in a Spitfire. They do tend to dig in and end up upside down if there's anything in their way. So we were very, very lucky in that. Engine gauges, uh, engine end gauges, I've mentioned fatigue. Coming home. It's very interesting when you spend two and a half years building up to something and that something is four months long and every day you have stress and every day you have something both incredibly tiring and fatiguing but also magnificent and wonderful. It really stretches your emotions and then the next day you're not doing any of it and the next day and the next and it's amazing, amazing the effect it had on the entire team and actually how long it took us all to recover from the trip. The psychology of that, we've done a little bit of work on. Uh, I'm not going to go into it now, but I found it really interesting to find this quote from, from the Duke of Wellington about how we all kind of felt. What has really helped is actually doing these talks and time, and I, I become more and more proud, actually, of what we achieved uh, the more I do this and the more I realise, you know, um, what we've done. So what do we achieve? We survived, we flew the flag for the UK, we've hopefully inspired kids into an aviation adventure, we're inspiring people generally to follow <laughs> their dreams. I'm not completely over it yet. <laughs> Charity donation and we set a new world record. No one else at Transpired has been stupid enough to fly a single-seat, anything, piston-powered around the world before. Uh, so, we got that. <laughs> a World War II fighter plane is trying to break a world record. Pilots Steve Brooks and Matt Jones hope to fly a silver Spitfire around the world in four months. On one expedition, we had an engine failure over the sea. Unconscious by the time they got to us. There is no automation involved. There is no autopilot. There are no systems that warn you when things are going wrong. When you've seen it from space and you realise the magnitude of what this undertaking is, they'll be unique in, in having done this. You look around and you can feel the people who flew it, the people who fought in it. So it's a massive project to build this machine back to its original specification. You see this aeroplane now, you can see its personality. The trip is dangerous. Pretty much every terrain you can think of. The fog, the icing, the clouds. This is challenging flying. It's starting to get quite real now. You get to come home in between. We're not supposed to come home in between. My girlfriend's pregnant. Oh, you idiot! <laughs> the closer we get to going, the harder I'm finding it. I want him to be himself and fulfil his dreams. He's got an amazing team going with him. You're one of the support crew, aren't you? I've come here to keep Steve and Matt out of trouble. Jerry Jones, I'm chief engineer. The aeroplane had such an important part to play around the world, not just in the UK. 30 countries we're going to, it fought in 26 of them. We want to see the world, and what a way to see it. Much better to be down here wishing you were up there than up there wishing you were down here. Fly uh, science missions on the ice cap. Most places where we go, we get lots of smiles and handshakes. Here was notably different. We just want to move on. Every time he speaks to me, he's looking into my soul. It's wrong. I've got a problem. I've got a problem. I've just got to get home. It's 
step wells are very important for the survival of a city like this. The most amazing day ever. Thank you for visiting. I have never seen such a cool aircraft and I hope you are both so will be successful. What an experience. Absolutely incredible, Matt. I think, you know, I don't think it wasn't just you that was getting emotional. I think you had all of us emotional, everybody as emotional as I was as well, li listening to the la latter part of that. Absolutely incredible. And uh, a fantastic Thanks, presentation as well. Appreciate that. Thank you. After such a, a comprehensive talk, has Matt not covered everything? Are, 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 are there actually anybody? I'm going to have a job seeing, actually. It's quite dark. I've got a question right down here at the back, a question here at the front. I'm going to be lazy and go to the front first. Um, I wondered, Matt, why the Spitfire was shown going from left to right at the end when I would have thought you were going right to left. You are obviously a very smart man because you're the first person that's ever spotted that and mentioned it. The door of the Pilatus is on the left-hand side. So we couldn't take footage of the white cliffs with the red arrows going that way. So we had to do a loop. Spot, spot on. We thought about reversing that shot, but then thought, who's going to pick that up? <laughs> did, we, did we have a question down here? Oh, yeah. Here we go. Oh, yeah. um, during the uh, sort of rebuilding process of the Spitfire and with this in mind, were any conversations had about sort of reintroducing the what were drop tanks? Um, to increase the range of the aircraft again, or was that just not a, not a feasible option? Yeah, well, it was a, a very much part of our consideration, uh, and it was it was finally kiboshed by our discussion with the Americans about flying in their airspace, and they just said, anything that you can release from an aircraft is a missile, and therefore we won't let you into our airspace. Uh, and then to be, to be fair, you know, back in the day when they were using them, it was wartime, it was a requirement, but if I had 90 gallons of fuel sitting under me and I had an engine failure just after takeoff, I can't honestly say that I would do the right thing and not eject that 90 gallons. And where would it go? And that's the problem. So, so that was certainly a consideration, but, uh, and we've, we've got the tanks as well, we've got all the connections, and Gertie's got everything we needed just to actually just bolt it straight on. So it would have been a great fix, but sadly not. Interesting question. Any other questions for, uh, for, for Matt? Got another one just here. You went to some extraordinarily difficult locations, and I wonder how you managed to actually get permission. I mean, Russia must have been hard, and Myanmar, Myanmar possibly was almost impossible. Can you tell us a little about that? Yeah, sure. So. Um it was actually the work that we decided to do with the FCO, the, the, the Foreign Office, that opened up a lot of doors for us in that respect. So they were able to, we were able to bypass asking the guy at the bottom of the pile if we could have permission who would say no, and like, like in Hong Kong, get right to the top. Uh, but it still wasn't, you know, for Japan, for example, we spent months petitioning them. You know, we had to demonstrate the professionalism of the rebuild, of the way we maintain the aircraft, of the pilots who were flying and their backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. So much so that Steve wasn't, Steve was a private pilot. He wasn't allowed to fly in Japan because it was one of the conditions they put on allowing it in. So it, it, that was hard work, certainly. Okay, another question here at the front from Mike. Thank you. Matt, of all of the things that you learned, if you were doing it again, would there be anything different? Yeah, I think one of the downsides to being sponsors is that we had sponsored is that we had requirements, date requirements that we had to go for, and that added an enormous amount of time pressure to us. I would love, and also, you know, there's, there's seven of us travelling, and that has a cost, quite a significant cost for every day that we're away. I would love to do the trip again without that time pressure. 
just to sit back and enjoy it and go on the right days and look out the window and spend a bit of time going to some of the places that we didn't have a time to look around because the weather was, was good for us to carry on. Okay. Uh, okay, we'll take one, one more question just from here from the front. Hi, Matt. Brilliant talk. Knew it was going to be. Stunning, thank you. I just want to ask, it looked to me as if you ta changed the real tailpane on the back of the aircraft from the original sort of Mark One rounded type to the pointed one. <laughs> Are you two related? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good spot. So because we put, so, so the round tail, the standard tail is what it should have and is what it's got on it now. For the trip, because we put the 66 gallons of fuel behind the pilot, the centre of gravity moved quite a long way aft. So we needed every little bit of controllability in yaw to counteract that. And that... Um, Broadcord, sorry, yeah, broadcord rudder made the difference. Adds about to a normally configured aircraft, it adds about a five knot extra crosswind capability. So you keep all the bits and put back on the aircraft now it's gone back again. Yeah, so so the CAA only allowed us to put those rear fuel tanks in uh, for the trip. We read all the pilots' notes from wartime and it said only above average pilots should ever be allowed to fly the aircraft in this configuration, which made a mockery of us. But um, <laughs> but but as a result, they said, as soon as you're back, we want those tanks out. So we took them out. We put them. You'll notice there was no mast on it for the trip. The mast is the original mast is now back on it, and the old tailplane is back on it as well. So it's got all the original, as many of the original bits back in it as we as we could put in. So I'm sure some of you were at the Goodwood Revival uh, l last weekend and uh, saw saw Matt flying. He he and a couple of other Spitfires opened the day every day and. Uh, uh, cl closed it again every evening, and then during the middle part of the day, then the Silver Spitfire was uh, on static display outside your outside your hangar. Yes. I assume the intention is to do that at the revival ev ev every year, presumably. Hope so. Yeah, certainly. Yeah. As yeah. long as you're, you're invited back. I'm as sure. long as you're invited back. I flew. In, I flew in a, on the Saturday night. Flew in a DJ, which was uh, pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> to to go to the party. Was afterwards. that the night I saw? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was that night? Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Okay. One well, other thing I just wanted to say, just quickly, uh, there will be a documentary. It's finished. I don't know when it's going to come out, but the, that last clip was essentially a sizzler for the documentary. So if I haven't bored you too much tonight, maybe keep an eye out for it when it does come out. Okay. Have we got, is it, is it a, a quick one? Yeah, a very quick one. Do you have any idea at all where the Silver Spitfire will end up um, stationed, as it were? Yep, so... I mean, you talk a lot about Goodwood, I'm hoping, because I live near Goodwood. <laughs> so it's there at the moment. So when we got back from the trip, the, the chap who lent us the Pilatus made us an offer to buy it, which we couldn't turn down. But it was on the proviso that we continue to engineer it, run it, and fly it. The upshot of that, he's from Denmark, the upshot of that means he's going to spend probably eight or nine months a year in Denmark, mostly over the winter, but we'll have it here in the summer for about three months each year. As it has been, as it was last year, and as it has been this year. The nice thing about that is actually, you know, you know, I'm very, very fond of that aeroplane. Obviously, great still to have a connection to it. Um, but Denmark doesn't have any representation of the Spitfires that they had, and they had exactly this type. Uh, they had exactly the Mark, the Mark 9 with the, the standard, standard rudder. Um, and it's great that it's there, telling the story to an audience that probably doesn't get it as much as we do here. So. Okay, thanks. A uh, big round of applause again from Matt, please, everyone. Thank you. I think, I think Matt, that's, that's the longest round of applause we've ever had, so uh, fantastic. Thank so, you. So a couple of points, remember, you can actually fly with Matt. He does fly the two-seat Spitfire out, out, of, uh, out of Goodwood. Uh, I heard a rumour that he was booked up for the whole of next year, but that's not true. He does have availability in his two-seat Spitfire uh, in the next several months if, uh, if you want to do that. Um, but by tradition, I forget about the raffle, but uh, this once I'm actually going to remember. Um, but Final thing for me is we've got lots more excellent talks coming up. Do look on the website. We've actually got talks right through to, I think, June, July of next year. And uh, also, again, please, if you're not already a member of Brooklyn's uh, members, please do join at the back uh, with our, our colleagues there from Outreach. Thank you all very much indeed for coming. And uh, that's it from me. Tim will do the raffle, and I'll see you all next time. Thank you very much.